discussing the manuscript of first in human four chamber pressure volume loop analysis during TAVR. The reason why we selected this case uh, is that after peer review, it has been one of the best manuscripts we have received in the last 18 months that we uh, have the journal. And as an editorial board, when we saw this paper, we were quite enthusiastic. We felt that it's so important and it's uh, for every clinician. And uh, for me as an imager, uh, maybe I will say that I start now understanding the pressure loop analysis. I think it's so important for clinical practice. I will give you the word now to Dr. Eugene Brailowski to present the panel and the discussion. And uh, from my behalf, I am really grateful for, accept, for all of you to accept to be here today. Hi, everyone. Great to be here and thank you so much for joining us. We have an exciting panel and exciting discussion today. So I'm Eugene Brailowski from Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And I'm joined today by Dr. Michael Brenner from Columbia University Medical Center in New York, Dr. Mohammed Saraf from Division of Cardiology from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Dr. Daniel Burkhoff from Cardiovascular Research Foundation and Columbia University Medical Center in New York, and Professor Nicholas uh, Van Meehem from uh, Ramos University uh, in Rotterdam, Netherlands. So we're here for Jack Case Report's webinar. Um, and like Dr. Grops has said, we're gonna talk about the first inhuman four chamber uh, pressure volume analysis during TAVR. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you. So why don't we start with the presentation, Dr. Brenner, why don't you take us away? Thank you, Dr. Brelovsky. Thank you, Dr. Grapsa. Um, on behalf of myself, Dr. Saraf, Dr. Burkhoff, uh, very excited to present this case uh, and be a part of this panel. Also, really appreciate Dr. Van Meehem for, for joining us. Um, so we have uh, no, no relevant disclosures. Um, our goals today, we'll, we'll run through an introduction to pressure volume analysis and then explain the, the case, the, the analysis that we did. Um, highlighting some of the results from pressure volume analysis and then open it up for, for sort of a, a hopefully a very fruitful discussion about pressure volume analysis and structural heart disease. So our, our key learning objectives um, this afternoon are, are twofold. Uh, number one, we want to understand a little bit about the technique uh, for performing and interpreting pressure volume loops. Um, and then we want to apply those to specifically um, a patient who underwent uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR um, for severe aortic stenosis. The pressure volume loop, um, as you can see here, um, is a, a plot with volume on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. Um, each loop represents a single cardiac cycle, um, and each contour or each uh, distinct contour of the loop represents the particular cardiac cycle. We typically begin here on the bottom right with the mitral valve when the mitral valve closes at end diastole. There are morphologic changes in the ventricle such that pressure within the chamber changes without any changes in volume, a period that we describe as isovolumetric contraction. Um, eventually, pressure increases in the ventricle to open the aortic valve, which results in the ejection phase that I'm highlighting here. Um, eventually, the aortic valve closes as pressure climbs, and there's a period between the aortic valve closure and the mitral valve opening where there are, again, morphologic changes in the ventricle such that pressure changes without any changes in volume, a period called isovolumetric relaxation. Um, and then once the mitral valve opens, diastole um, uh, begins, and you start to fill the left ventricle with blood from the left atrium. The mitral, the um, uh, filling phase typically has two periods, a passive phase where there aren't significant changes in pressure, um, and then a more active phase towards the end of diastole where you start to see a rise in ventricular pressure um, as left ventricular volume increases. Now, the, the shape of the pressure volume loop is defined by two fundamental relationships, which are characterized by these dashed gray lines here. The first is the end systolic pressure volume relationship, which um, uh, connects a point on the volume axis intercept with the point of end systole, and it reflects maximal elastance within, within the ventricle. The second relationship that sort of defines the, the bottom bound of the, of, the, of the pressure volume loop is the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, which describes the diastolic properties of, of the ventricle. Now, what I've, what I've shown you here already really only describes or is, is the most applicable for left ventricular pressure volume loop, but the pressure volume loop in the right ventricle is a little bit different than in the left ventricle in a number of important ways, which I've highlighted here in this slide. 
So here in the, in the blue, you can see the right ventricular pressure volume um, uh, loop here. And you'll note that the pressures in the, in the right ventricle are lower than in the left ventricle. And as a result, end systolic elastins and the end systolic pressure volume relationship um, or the slope of that relationship is, is, is lower than it is in, in the left ventricle. And importantly, at least in the normal right heart, there are no more prominent isovolumetric uh, pressure changes um, such that um, isovolumetric contraction and um, relaxation are blunted. Now, the atrial pressure volume loops um, are, are characterized here. These are a subject of, of, of active research right now. There are distinct uh, components of the atrial pressure volume loop. You can see here that there's a, an A loop um, to the left side of the loop, and then there's a B loop. The A loop describes the active contractile properties of the atria towards the end of um, ventricular diastole when the atria contract, um, forcing blood in from the atria into the ventricle. And then there's the V loop that describes the passive sort of conduit function of the atria. Now, I should say that this schematic that we presented here really only applies to sinus rhythm, um, and the A loop in particular is absent in patients with atrial fibrillation. And then just like the ventricular pressure volume loops, the atrial pressure volume loops are defined by an end systolic and an end diastolic pressure volume relationship. The unique thing about the atrial pressure volume loops is that unlike the ventricular pressure volume uh, loop, which has its end diastolic pressure volume relationship defined by a period at end diastole, the atrial pressure volume loops have an EDPVR, an end diastolic pressure volume relationship that's defined by this point at end reservoir, which is the largest volume that the atria uh, encounter. And so hopefully that gives you a framework or a basic understanding for what we're going to discuss in the next few minutes, um, which is the, the case of a patient with severe aortic stenosis who underwent TAVR. So the, the patient was a, is a 71-year-old male, has hypertension, has severe COPD, as well as frailty, which generated a high STS score, such that he was not offered surgical aortic valve replacement. He was symptomatic with advanced heart failure symptoms, but otherwise had preserved by ventricular function, at least by ejection fraction. Um, in terms of his aortic uh, valve morphology, he had a bicuspid aortic valve, Seavers type 1, um, and here you see listed the indices of, of severity of his aortic stenosis. Um, in order to conduct pressure volume analysis in this patient, we used a high fidelity conductance catheter that was placed in every cardiac chamber before and after TAVR. And this was facilitated using a steerable sheath that allowed us to maneuver the catheter into the different cardiac chambers. Um, and importantly, the left side of the heart, the left atrium, as well as the left ventricle were accessed by a transeptal puncture. And so all the initial access was done from the femoral vein. Um, the catheter was, was positioned um, in the left ventricle during TAVR implantation as well, such that we were able to acquire pressure volume loops um, exactly at the time that the valve was deployed. Here is um, a, a picture um, from, our, from our article just showing you what a conductance catheter looks like. It's a, it's a pigtail catheter, seven French. There is um, in the middle portion of the catheter, um, this light region is the pressure sensor that records pressure and, um, uh, instantaneously. And then you see here these metal electrodes which generate an electric field that ultimately allow us to make the volume measurements to describe ventricular properties. Um, I know it's kind of difficult to imagine how, how we actually position the catheter. So these are fluoroscopic images that, that are in our, in our article um, that basically show you how the catheter was positioned, in this case, in the left ventricle. Um, and given that there are so many catheters here, we outline sort of which, which catheter is, is what. So you see here from the inferior vena cava, there's a steerable sheath making the transeptal puncture, and then the conductance catheter is inserted through the steerable sheath and guided here into the left atrium. Um, in addition to using fluoroscopic guidance, um, the catheter placement was also facilitated echocardiographically, and this was particularly helpful uh, for structures like the right ventricle, um, which were just less not noticeable on, on fluoroscopy. In terms of the TAVR procedure, um, there was a, 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 it was a little bit complicated in the sense that by CT measurement, 
um, the, the patient was sized for a 26 millimeter S3 prosthesis, but you know, when, um, uh, when the valve was deployed, there was significant or, uh, paravalvular aortic regurgitation, such that a 29 millimeter prosthesis was ultimately implanted. And so um, next we'll move on to the actual results of, of pressure volume analysis. Um, and so here on this, you can see um, the pressure volume loops that were recorded in the baseline condition before the TAVR um, uh, prosthesis was implanted. You see that the atrial, the right and the left atrial loops are different than what has been described um, sort of in the, in the textbook. And these are some of the first atrial loops um, in humans to, to, to be presented. You see that we don't see the classic A and B loops uh, very distinctively, and I suspect that these um, predominantly reflect the active or contractile aspects of, of atrial um, pressure volume changes. The right and left ventricle, uh, ref, left ventricular pressure volume loops are featured here. You see that the right ventricular pressure volume loop does not have the typical um, uh, pressure volume loop appearance uh, um, that I had showed in, a, in an earlier slide, insofar as the appearance of the loop is far more rectangular, and you see clear isovolumetric periods, suggesting that there's some underlying abnormality in the baseline right ventricular pressure volume loop. Um, and then in terms of the left ventricular pressure volume loop, you see that the stroke volume is narrow um, and there's an elevated effective arterial elastance, which is um, the point that connects the end diastolic point and the end systolic point. Um, and the slope of that line we use as sort of a summative um, uh, reflection of afterload. Um, and so at baseline, as expected um, in a patient with aortic stenosis, we see the influence of, of significant uh, afterload. These next uh, loops illustrate what happened during actual TAVR deployment. So these blue loops recapitulate the baseline condition. Um, and then as, as many of you know, in order to deploy a TAVR prosthesis, the ventricle is, is rapidly paced, usually through a, a pacing catheter that's placed in the right ventricle. In this case, the ventricle was paced at 180 beats a minute. And you see that at that time, stroke volume diminishes substantially, almost to zero, such that there's nothing actually ejected out of the ventricle. And you see contractility decrease substantially. Um, and importantly, the, um, um, uh, the um, yeah, so contractility de declines and stroke volume um, almost goes to null. When ventricular pacing ceases, however, you see that the pressure volume loop, although it regains that, that the, the shape that it had at baseline, you see that the pressure volume loop is shifted dramatically to the right. The ventricle dilates. Now, instead of occupying an end diastolic volume of 175 milliliters, it shoots out to almost 250 milliliters. Um, and the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship, which roughly reflects contractility, is markedly declined from the baseline condition. And then, after a, a, a brief period um, for re-equilibration, um, uh, post-procedural pressure volume loops were measured, and there are important differences between the baseline and the post-procedure condition. I'll start with the left ventricle here. You can see in blue, in the light blue, we've provided the baseline pressure volume loops just for reference, and you can see that the end systolic pressure volume relationship has almost the same slope as the baseline condition, but not completely. And what we inferred from that is that recovery after rapid ventricular pacing is not complete. The right ventricular pressure volume loop um, is, however, uh, different. The end diastolic properties are similar, but the um, end systolic properties are, are not. And in terms of the atria, you see that the right atrium seems to be unloaded in the sense that end diastolic pressure and volume are both reduced. But the same cannot be said for the left ventricular, the left atrial pressure volume loops, which seem to be operating at a higher pressure, indicating that the atria are more loaded, perhaps because of the decline in left ventricular function. And so, the, to summarize, the, the key findings um, that, that we observed from this are, are fourfold. So, number one, at baseline, prior to TAVR implantation, right ventricular function is abnormal. Um, number two, that pacing um, during TAVR deployment results in um, a significant decline in left ventricular contractility. While it improves and recovers over time, that recovery is not complete. Um, in addition, left ventricular afterload is, is multifactorial um, in the sense that although the uh, aortic stenosis was, re was relieved by the TAVR deployment, 
The reality is that the effective arterial elastance before and after the case was nearly identical, suggesting that there are other causes of elevated ventricular afterload besides just the stenotic valve. Um, and finally, in terms of atrial unloading, we observed that there was improvement in right atrial function, but not in left ventricular function, suggesting that there are, again, other factors that impact how the atria responds to a procedure like TAP. And so just to, to wrap things up and, and, and sort of stimulate some questions for, for additional discussion, I think that the take home points from, from this kind of analysis break down into two main categories. There are technical things that we learned from this case, and then there are theoretical um, insights that we appreciated or insights that are relevant to the pathophysiology of structural heart disease. So first, I think we, we demonstrated that pressure volume analysis in all four cardiac chambers is feasible. Here, I've sort of listed for you how we actually accomplished that and, and what was the um, sort of scheme of, of obtaining these pressure volume uh, loops. Um, I should mention that we did make an, an, an interatrial septal defect with the transeptal puncture, but based on the hemodynamic measurements and the patient's um, and, and echocardiographic evidence, we did not feel that it was necessary to close um, that, uh, that defect. The second thing that, that we learned is that integrate catheter placement in the left ventricle can, can yield very high quality pressure volume loops, and that's particularly helpful um, in a patient who's been undergoing aortic valve intervention. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of hesitation to put new catheter through the aortic valve uh, that was just implanted. Um, and in addition, the conductance catheter may introduce some uh, component of an aortic regurgitation. Um, as the leaflets can't coact perfectly around the catheter. And so we eliminated those concerns by putting the catheter integrated in, into the left ventricle. In terms of the um, sort of filter or, or, or pathophysiologic insights that we got from, from, this, from this case, here it was clear to us that procedural elements impact the hemodynamic response to TAVR. And this is contrary to what has been reported in the literature elsewhere, where there are clear hemodynamic improvements after TAVR. So this is a case um, that was featured um, uh, last year in a patient with moderate aortic stenosis and depressed ventricular function. And you can see that before and after TAVR, there are significant, after TAVR, there are significant improvements in ventricular function in the sense that the ventricle is unloaded and contractility increases. We did not observe that in this case, and I suspect the reason why is because of the deleterious components of the procedure like ventricular pacing and the ventricular stunning that it produced um, as a consequence. And then finally, again, I think we, we illustrated um, by focusing on atrial uh, pressure volume analysis that um, uh, atrial uh, function is a black box. We don't know a lot about it, and it hasn't been well characterized with pressure volume analysis. Um, but in the least, the pressure volume loops that we obtained in the atrium are different than, than what has been produced either in modeling studies as well as in animal studies like the one featured here in this, in this figure. Um, and so certainly more needs to be needs to be done to understand really what the net impact on atrial function that a procedure like TAVR or other structural heart interventions have. And so that uh, concludes our, our presentation. We're excited, obviously, to, to discuss more with you all. I just wanted to acknowledge everyone um, who participated in the study, um, certainly Dr. Saraf, Dr. Burkhoff, and we appreciate Dr. Van Meehan for joining us. Um, you can see that um, although there were only us three on the on the paper. This was really the product of a lot of collaborative work from a, from a broad group of, of leaders and, and experts in, the, in this field. So with that, I'll turn it over um, to Dr. Berlowski uh, for the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner. This was really fantastic. What a great case to, to discuss further. I'll open up to discussion. Maybe I'll start with the first question and then We'll, uh, we'll take it from there. So you've clearly shown there was myocardial stunning during the procedure, probably related to the pacing itself, and then there was incomplete recovery. So my question is, can you use PV loops to one, either predict what would happen afterwards, or maybe uh, is it only used diagnostically? Um, mm -hmm. And does it provide any more uh, information than um, ECHO would provide or SWAN uh, information would provide uh, post uh, TAVR deployment? Mm 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I think at, at this nascent stage of our pressure volume loop program, um, uh, the purpose is really diagnostics. Eventually, we would like to gather sufficient information and gain insights into the pathophysiology of the ventricular as well as the atrial responses to you know, various structural heart interventions to be able to, to use it prognostically and in particular to correlate the findings that we, we found with various non-invasive modalities so that not all patients have to undergo pressure volume analysis. So that's certainly the future of, of, of this kind of research. But I think at this phase, um, we are only in a, in a position to, to make, um, to use the conductance catheter for diagnostic purposes. I think that it does, however, illustrate a number of key points that cannot be gleaned from the routine uh, non-invasive or even invasive um, Swan-Gans catheter-based methods to characterize hemodynamics. So if you'll, if you'll recall, in the pressure volume loops before and after the case, we demonstrated that there were significant reductions in contractility, yet ventricular pressure and presumably systemic pressure were not significantly different. And so I think that's an important insight in the sense that if you use traditional modalities, let's say an arterial catheter, or even for that matter, a Swan-Gans catheter, you may not realize how poor or how poorly adapted the ventricular response is to certain interventions like TAVR um, if you use these um, uh, non-specific parameters like the arterial pressure um, to gauge whether hemodynamics have or have not changed significantly. That's great. Thank you. Dr. Burkhoff, Dr. Uh, Saraf, has this case something you modeled in Harvey before? And is it how does it compare to your modeling techniques and what you've seen in real life? Um, so there are there are so many different aspects of, of this case that were exciting. Um, but we can go chamber by chamber. Um, first is uh, left ventricle, that's maybe the easiest. Um, and actually, Dr. Van Mayhem has made many measurements of uh, of LV pressure volume loops during and after TAVR. So it'd be really important to get his comments on this. Um, but uh, basically, the the main observation that we see is that the the peak peak ventricular pressure goes down, which you expect after reducing the gradient. Uh, but there's not not a huge change in 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 the uh, the stroke volume in the end. Um, uh, in the, in this uh, cases where the ventricular ejection fraction um, at baseline was reasonably normal, but we do see, um, as uh, Dr. Brenner was pointing out, variable effects on on contractility at the end of the case, um, where sometimes you can see an improvement in contractility, and sometimes you see this decrease that we saw in this case, which you would not ordinarily uh, see in um, um, if you're just looking at pressures. Um, so these are things that certain aspects of this are very consistent with Harvey, the, the simulations, because, you know, obviously we, we, we can show a reduction in peak ventricular pressure and almost no change in stroke volume if you start out with a normal uh, ejection fraction. But these other aspects really are reflecting a more complex biological response that, um, that really is not incorporated into the, uh, to the simulations. Uh, right ventricle, same kind of thing. We do see that um, the, the feature of here that Dr. Brenner was referring to, that's not um, typical of a normal RV loop, is the fact that this patient had basically some elevated pulmonary pressures, and that really, uh, during those kind of situations, the um, the loop looks more rectangular, and we do have the isovolumic contraction and relaxation phases. And that is, those are things that we also learn from Harvey. If you increase PVR, Increased wedge pressure, the loop will go from a kind of a rounded loop, like what you see on the, the top right, the emblem on the up above the Columbia emblem here on the right, uh, to a more rectangular um, um, uh, loop with um, uh, with the uh, with the uh, isovolumic periods clearly uh, demonstrated. Now, with regard to atrial right and left atrial pressure uh, volume relationships, this is now tr uh, really blazing new territory, and I think. As we are getting more, as as uh, in in heart failure and various uh, uh, EP settings, we're getting more interested in understanding atrial properties and atrial um, atriopathies. Um, I think this is this the thing. One of the things that excited me most about this case was really, uh, you know, these measurements that were made in the right and the left atria. Um, you showed uh, Mickey showed uh, the loops from animal studies. Um, of right of left atrial um, loops 
that I think he's going to bring up here from uh, Dr. Shikawa's uh, lab in uh, Mount Sinai, uh, which really show very classic, uh, classic shapes of, uh, of what we think of atrial loops with a prominent A and a, and a V um, uh, uh, loops. These are, this is what we see in Harvey as well. And in Harvey, we, where we are able to modify things, we can we can understand what are the determinants of this, the relative sizes of the A and the V component. And um, uh, these are, are uh, really beautifully illustrated in this case. Now, in the human cases, there were not so clear V uh, components, the, the, uh, uh, the ventricular uh, loop part was not so prominent. And uh, you see here that you see the A component and at the bottom, there's some suggestions that there's some squiggles there's some squiggles at the bottom there on both sides, but we don't see the prominent, uh, the prominent V. So whether this simply reflects the fact that we're not capturing all the volume um, at this point, uh, or that this is a different uh, contraction pattern in the in the setting of of uh, the pathology that we're that we're studying here, yet has yet to be determined. But I think this is a, a major advance, uh, just technologically showing that this is feasible to measure these things. Um, and there's a lot of interest in understanding atrial mechanics in HEFPEF, um, in atrial fibrillation, uh, pre and post uh, ablations, um, and uh, in other forms of, uh, of heart failure as well, um, where um, you know atrial uh, stiffness and atrial contractility is being invoked uh, right now. And what we have from ECHO are looking at left and right atrial strains which uh, may or may not correlate directly or give the same amount of information as you're gonna get from, uh, from these pressure volume loops. So I think this represents a first in man demonstration of the feasibility of positioning the catheters percutaneously. And uh, I think we're very excited to, uh, to see application of this uh, moving forward in, in the atrial, in, in terms of uh, demonstrating atrial uh, mechanics. So those would be my my comments, maybe maybe uh, Nicholas would like to comment as well from his uh, all of his experience with these, uh, with both structural heart disease and also with uh, the measurements of pressure volume loops, which he's uh, among the the highest uh, uh, has the most experience in the world in measuring these loops. Yeah, so so, so sure. So thank you very much, Dan, for um, for uh, your insights. And what we have been doing the last couple of years is we have increasingly been using PV loops in complex PTI cases and structural heart cases. And we also have seen already some uh, some literature published on the use of uh, continuous PV loop measurements during mitral clip uh, implants, for instance. So the data that you can generate is can be quite um, revealing, but also overwhelming. And at this point in time, we are still uh, very open to a almost multidisciplinary and multi-person assessment of the PV loops as we are making them, because there is so much you can get out of this. And even in this particular case, which was quite spectacular, also from a procedural point of view, because of course you first had a, uh, an S326 and then ended up with implanting uh, an S329 in the S326. So something must have happened during that procedure, and I would assume that uh, massive uh, aortic regurgitation uh, at one point occurred, and that might also have explained this dramatic shift to the right, this, this immediate dramatic shift of the right in the in the LV mm. pressure volume uh, uh, loop. Uh, but then uh, what is also striking is that at one point the, the ventricle will start uh, to uh, to recover, although it was not a full recovery. What we have seen in the cases that we've done so far, and I must say that our Tavra cases that we monitored with PV loops were predominantly patients with depressed LV function and moderate aortic stenosis, so potentially a different patient than the patient that was shown here. We see quite dramatic immediate effects, and another very interesting aspect that you will get from the PV loops is you have the segmental PV loops. So you have these electrodes, but there are five to seven electrodes in the ventricle and they all offer you a PV loop per segment. 
And what we saw or what we see, what we are seeing in our patients with depressed LV function, regardless of their QRS complexes on the EKG, is that there is quite significant segmental dyssynchrony. And interestingly, when we replace the valve, we see a resynchronization. And that seems to have an immediate effect on the end systolic pressure volume relationship that becomes much steeper and that also then suggests an immediate improvement in contractility. So basically, this was a this was an eye-opener for me. And at the same time, it is so it, it teaches you a lot. Also, from an immediate point of view, what, what, what is happening to this ventricle? And it can uh, be not only diagnostic, but definitely also be predictive. So I, I do foresee that we, uh, we can use these PV loops, these immediate PV loops, for, to predict patients who will do well in the short run or in the midterm uh, uh, follow-up. So especially if you, not only for TAVIS, but also, for instance, in mitral clip or in tricuspid uh, uh, repair. I think uh, PV loops can really, um, yeah, tell us wh who are the patients uh, whose ventricle will, will recover and can deal with the uh, with the improvement in TR or MR, so I think we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen the latest uh, or the last on uh, on PV loops in clinical practice now, and I foresee a growing uh, adoption. But I think it's uh, this case was very spectacular uh, for me because for the first time I saw uh, pressure volume loops in the four chambers. I've never seen that before. Uh, I thought it was quite a, quite a, an overwhelming uh, demonstration. And um, it's, it, you know, there are a lot of hypotheses on how to explain, but we must not forget that we are now trying to understand from a quite complicated procedure. So I think um, I can only make an argument to, to, uh, to implement and adopt this technology more and more in our, um, in our practice, maybe at first in academic institutions to allow us to understand better uh, certain concepts, but also to integrate it better in what we can simulate, because the the Harvey simulation to me is really the basis of understanding of pressure volume loop analysis uh, in um, in my practice. So, Nicholas, um, we maybe pick up a little bit on what you were saying, and also um, a little bit about uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Berlowski was was questioning before is. You know, right now, and you know, we, we've been measuring pressure volume loops for 50 years since the 1970s, and in you know, in 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 large in research uh, settings in animals and and humans since the 70s, and it has not really it has not really infiltrated into clinical practice per se, but I, I do think, as you are just implying that um, that as these techniques get more uh, simpler and and um, and more adopted. There is a potential for them to play a role diagnostically, prognostically, and maybe even therapeutic—not uh, therapeutically, but to understand choices of therapies. Um, do you, is that something that you, um, you know, you you being a prolific user and, and measurer of these loops, um, is that something that you can you can foresee? Yeah, well, there's no question that we're already doing that, um, especially in the in the exciting field of functional MR. Um, you know the controversy with MitraFR and COAPT. Yep. Um, we we do see patients with very poor ventricles with ejection fractions below twenty percent, and then it becomes unpredictable from a clinical point of view as a clinician to understand or even predict the patients that will do better with uh, FMR reduction or dramatically uh, fade out, fade out uh, immediately after the procedure. And I think this is where uh, immediate pressure volume uh, monitoring can, can, may, can be a difference and separate the patients who will do better yeah. versus the patients who will, who will really get into, into real problems. And I think um, as we are clipping those patients, you will see the immediate effects of the PV loops and what happens on afterload and contractility. And if you see that the ventricle is deteriorating, those are the patients that you, where you want to withdraw the clip and vice versa. I think you, when, you, when you see that the ventricle is accommodating uh, almost immediately, then you know that the patient will benefit clinically from uh, the reduction in, uh, in, uh, in their FMR. I think that you know, Nicholas. We've we've spoken before about this. That uh, there's a huge opportunity. I think now to understanding uh, right heart failure with tricuspid, 
regurgitation. And, um, and, and maybe you have some experience with that already, um, but I think uh, this is now a wide open field. Tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure is very complicated physiologically. We, we can look at right heart casts, we can look at V waves, we can look at PA pressures, but really in terms of predicting who's gonna do well and not do well, I think is, is right now an open question as I understand it. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's, uh, we, ju we just don't know. We just don't know based on echo, uh, based, based on the echo information and the pulmonary pressures of the right uh, right heart cats that we're performing up front. Very difficult to to predict the patients that will will get better or will do better uh, after a tricuspid repair. And I think another uh, very compelling indication might be uh, weaning patients from, for instance, an ECMO. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can monitor, you can you can see the effects of turning down uh, your support uh, on, on cardiac mechanics, and that will definitely help to identify the patients that that who are ready to be weaned yeah. or who is not. Yeah. So maybe um, we could ask Dr. Saraf. I mean, you know, you did a, a really masterful job of making these measurements. Very impressive. Yeah. And again, I think everyone's really uh, congratulating you on this co really, really nice contribution to uh, to the literature and and opening up uh, you know new avenues here. Um, maybe you want to maybe you want to make a few comments about about the case, but maybe also what motivated you to make these measurements uh, in the four chambers. Right. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Berkhoff. Uh, first off, I have to uh, say that this uh, collaboration, this uh, publication would not have happened without uh, your collaboration and your help. But uh, so uh, first things first, uh, there is no question that hemodynamics and uh, specifically echocardiography ha both have truly revolutionized our understanding of physiology and pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease. But what's really important here is that and in, in even during clinical practice, even at bedside, oftentimes we see that the, our findings in the cath lab or on the day of the procedure are completely different than the findings even within a day. Uh, anyone who performs TAVR um, uh, might have noticed frequently, I mean, it's too numerous to count now, that the numbers that you get, for example, on the day of the procedure, you get a... a Transvalvular transiotic uh, gradient of seven eight after the TAVR procedure, and then the very next day or right before discharge of the patient, you, you see a gradient of fourteen fifteen sixteen. It's uh, really not uh, logical to think that within a day you've had some valve leaflet deterioration. So uh, th that always uh, was a question to me that as to why or how we can explain this. Looking at these loops. Um, and might at least to some degree explain as to why we see a discrepancy between day zero and day one follow up. But more importantly, going beyond just treating numbers, at the end of the day, it's really not about the numbers or uh, hemodynamic parameters. We always want to treat the patient. And uh, one of the uh, questions that Dr. Berlowski mentioned in, re in regards to the correlation of our findings in a real patient versus uh, the simulator. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, in simulators, although we can introduce uh, disease processes, but we also have to understand that having a, a, a concomitant valve heart disease uh, will definitely have a huge impact on the, on the way that the, these PV looks, either on the left side or the right side, uh, would have an impact. And understanding these uh, changes, these real-life experience, uh, would be truly a, uh, a a treasure for us going forward. So even if we see some discrepancy between what we see on simulator and what we see on uh, in, in real life, that still doesn't mean that uh, there is anything in regards to anything suspicious about the simulator. We have to understand that the patient milieu is always different than, we, than what we see in the lab or even in the animal lab. So that's why we see, as you, may, as you, may, as you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the, the A loop and V loop in, in animal experiment is very different than what we have seen in this particular example. Now, the other thing that we also have to mention here is that we have to keep in mind that this catheter specifically is designed for right ventricle and left ventricle. And even if we look at the IFU, it's specifically uh, designed for ventricle, not atrium. So it's not been calibrated for the atrium. So we're still learning. 
in terms of what what's going to happen with the maybe we have to have separate catheters for the uh, for the atrium or maybe the calibration is completely different and so we're truly on, on the very first page of a uh, of a long textbook and uh, this is the very first time we were able to do the uh, case in in all four chambers Placement of the catheters for now, we, we, the three of us agree that maybe the atrial appendage, both on the right side and left side, might be the appropriate place and um, placement of the, uh, of the pigtail of the uh, PV loop catheter, mainly because the appendage, both on the right and left and the left is the only, uh, only muscular part of the, of the atrium. The rest of the atrium are pretty smooth because there are a b- bunch, they are part of the venous development. As part of the embryology of the of the two, so um, we are very excited that uh, we can do this. I think uh, one of the advantages of going anterograde, transeptal anterograde to the LV is that we can keep the uh, tip of the peak of the uh, of the catheter in exactly the same place. So even during the rapid ventricular pacing or uh, even if you uh, pass through the aortic valve retrograde, that doesn't really change the position of the uh, of the catheter. And more importantly, it's a lot easier to go to the very tip of the LV apex as well as RV apex when you go anterograde, as opposed to in the case of uh, retrograde. I believe it's a little bit more challenging. We have done a few uh, mitral patients as well. Uh, for mitral patients, we are going retrograde, and we have noticed that when we go retrograde, that our segmentation is not as clean as when we go anterograde. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll see what the future holds, but I personally believe that we uh, really need an international registry that we can all uh, can contribute to this registry, and we all learn together, we all grow together. And hopefully in future, as you and, and uh, the rest of the panel mentioned, uh, we can uh, learn which patients are going to get the most benefit, which patients. There, there might be patients that we, we can predict based on the PV loop in future that, you know what, no matter what, even if we put a, a TABR or even if I do a micro clip in your particular case, you may not really get any clinical benefits. So our patient selection would also become smarter in future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. Saraf, I have a brief technical question for you because I, I'm obviously very intrigued by uh, the transeptal approach. Also, using the steerable catheter, the agility sheet makes a lot of sense. It will uh, definitely make it much easier to navigate through the left atrium into the across the mitral valve and into the LV apex. But how do you deal with um, the as you are implanting the valve and you do the rapid pacing, will that not affect your conduction catheter? And not not necessarily the the position, but do you don't you agree that you need to recalibrate whenever you enter a device across the aortic valve into the ventricle? So don't you need to do you need to recalibrate the conductance catheter, or is that not mandatory? No, I think you're absolutely correct, and we actually do that. So uh, I think Dr. Brenner didn't have, we, we want to get to all the questions as well. So what we do is that for, so before the patient even comes to the cath lab or operating room, depending on wherever you practice, uh, the patient gets a 3D volume of the uh, right ventricle and left ventricle. Obviously, uh, measurement of the right atrium and left atrium is a little bit more challenging, but at least for the RV and LV. So we actually have the data from uh, the RV volume and LV volume. So that's how, that has already been measured. And then we also use hypertonic saline once we go across to the RV. And then once we go across to the LV, we do a baseline uh, hypertonic saline. And also after TAVR, we do another hypertonic saline. So we, we calibrate every time. So we're trying to be as accurate as possible. And one more, one more item that I have to mention, and one more very important point that I have to bring up here is that I don't believe, and I don't, I think Dr. Burkhoff and Dr. Brenner agree as well. We don't believe that our protocol is the best protocol yet. So one of the things that we can consider, especially in patients who are not in AFib, is that if we can, for example, pace the sinoatrial node, SA node, at a constant heart rate, and that heart rate can be anything beyond the baseline heart rate of the patient. If the patient is running at 75, we probably have to pace, or we can pace at a rate of 80 or 90, and then we can have a much more cleaner and much more standardized PV loops. Uh, 
But so um, obviously we don't want to rapid pace the patient because of the uh, because of what we have just dis discovered in a particular case. But we're still learning and we're trying to uh, improve our technique and steps as we are going forward. And we welcome any uh, any uh, feedback from our colleagues, especially someone as experienced as you are. No, I, I think I think we are in, a, in an exciting time, and I, I look forward to uh, to collaborating with you and with uh, the Columbia uh, Group, and you know also to maybe at one point come to some consensus on how how do we need to move forward with this technology, and how do we need to calibrate, and how do we need to execute these procedures in a more reproducible way. So I think this is a this is a very uh, this is a great uh, teaching case. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more, Nicholas. We're we actually are talking now about, you know, as you know very well know, you know, we're putting together a group of of people to write this RV review article. But in addition, because um, we see we see a lot of variability between how people measure, calibrate, and interpret these loops, and we we do believe that there is a need for a checklist slash consensus. That systematizes how these are are all three of those steps: measurement, calibration, analysis, and interpretation. Uh, Mickey has been spending a lot of time thinking about all these things, and as we struggle, even with just the the small, relatively small number of of cases that we have, you know, you see with every case offers a different challenge, um, on, on especially on calibration and. As you said, when you introduce a new device, a new a, when you do something that maybe moves the catheter just a little bit, the calibration comes off. So these are all things that we need to uh, not sweep under the rug, but we have to bring to the forefront and make sure that the data that we're getting that's being reported in in review articles, um, in um, in original articles, is accurate. And um, uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, discrepancies in how people report their data, and reviewers are not yet educated. So they're, they're, you know papers get published that have incorrect information in it. So I think that there is uh, a huge need right now as these loops are being measured in more and more settings by more and more people uh, for that resource. And we will be reaching out in addition to our RV review paper to do that exact same thing. And Great. speaking to that, Dr. Burkhoff, I know you spent enormous effort uh, bringing PV loops back into the mainstream, especially for the fellows. If you can spend a couple of minutes uh, just highlighting that effort and maybe uh, directing our listeners where they can get more structured education to, on PV loops and advanced hemodynamics in general. Sure. Um, yeah, our efforts um, have been to develop what we've referred to as the teach course and and Dr. Mayhem has been a big part of that. Um, we have a, a you know international faculty. Um, our goal has been to re-educate or educate for the first time uh, and re-educate some of the older folks um, on the the, uh, the 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 primary value uh, of the information you can get from pressure volume analysis. Um, this is something that used to be taught in medical schools. Now, with many schools dropping, even having not even having physiology courses, this is really getting pushed uh, pushed aside, and there's really no resource for fellows, young young physicians to to get this, uh, or very limited uh, um, uh, places to get this. So, of course, we have our teach courses that we run through CRF. Um, we do we do fellows courses. Uh, people can just contact me, and we we do small groups. Of, uh, of five to 10 fellows at a time. And we do large courses with uh, 50 to 100 people at a time. Um, we do these um, at the national meetings uh, until COVID. Uh, we're hoping to resume these in 2022, most likely. Um, but uh, we, we do run these courses uh, uh, virtually now for the small groups. So um, there's that. Um, that option, and also, of course, there's the Harvey simulator, which is at harvey.online, um, which uh, which has textbooks that go that that really walk you through um, the basics of pressure volume analysis. Um, so those are, and the the advantage of the Harvey simulator is that it it brings alive the loops. You know, if you're reading a textbook, a static textbook, and you look at 
at static images, it doesn't have the same feel, the same impact as when you see the loops going around and you, you change afterload, you change preload, you change contractility. I think it's much more impactful. It's almost like you're in the lab uh, measuring these things in real time. And I think it can be much more impactful. I mean, you know, uh, Eugene, you've taken the course a couple of times, I know. So uh, you can also speak to, uh, to its, uh, and, and also uh, Mohammed has as well. So you, you guys can speak to the, and, and Nicholas, you've given the courses. So we've all, uh, we've all, you know, experienced uh, the potential of what I, you know, I'm a little biased, but, you know, I think the potential power of these, uh, these educational resources. I think we're all a little biased on this call, but uh, <laughs> having taken it firsthand, I, I, it just changed the perspective entirely, and uh, not just mine. Everybody who's taken the course, the the uh, the feedback has been excellent, and it's just been uh, very eye-opening into advanced hemodynamics of and uh, cardiac mechanics. And the best part of it is that it's very interactive between between the. Uh, trainees and also the faculty that's that's probably the most uh, prolific part of the entire course and and it, it may also be an, a humble experience especially in the beginning but at the end of the day it is also a very intriguing and very rewarding experience because at the end of uh these uh, very specific trainings in cardiac mechanics, you really understand, you get different perspectives on mechanical circulation and complex uh, physiology of the of the heart. Absolutely. So Dr. Brenner and Dr. Burkhoff, can you provide some clinical takeaways from this case and from our discussion so far? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, just recapitulate the, the key findings uh, that we reported at the end. Um, in the um, uh, in the presentation, I think we learned in this case that um, uh, although the left ventricle was the focus in patients with aortic stenosis, uh, the the reality is that most likely patients have abnormalities in all chambers of, of the heart, in particular in the right ventricle, which we showed um, through this analysis. Um, the second takeaway point is that um, although the literature is full of cases of improved hemodynamics in response to TAVR. We here demonstrated that um, the hemodynamic response is multifactorial and may be influenced by key procedural steps like rapid ventricular pacing, which induces ventricular stunning. The recovery may occur, um, but the tempo of that recovery is not uniform. And in this patient, um, it appears as though the, the, at least in the very short term, um, the, the procedure was um, uh, uh, the, the hemodynamics after the procedure were not fully recovered. Um, and then as, as Dr. Burkhoff and Dr. Van Meehem and, and Dr. Saraf had sort of mentioned about our atrial analysis, I think we've opened the door um, to unlock and further explore what is going on in the atria um, and integrate that with what we understand about ventricular mechanics to provide a more comprehensive and holistic approach to how hemodynamics um, uh, uh, impact our way of, of viewing various cardiovascular pathology. Thank you all so much. Thank you, all, uh, panelists, for wonderful and really fruitful discussion. And I want to specifically thank Dr. Julia Grapsa and the Jack Case Reports uh, team for providing such a forum for such a wonderful discussions. And we hope to we hope to uh, more of these in the future. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Stay well.